next on Unsolved Mysteries. In the radical 60s, a college student turns to robbery to fund a militant protest group and ends up on the FBI's most wanted list. Two Catholic priests vanish, and one is found murdered. Police suspect that a serial killer may be responsible. Is there a mysterious energy field that can help heal the body? Those who benefited from Qigong say there is. A kidnapped baby is left with a stranger. Maybe you can help reunite him with his birth family. Five fascinating mysteries, some just waiting to be solved. I'm Dennis Farina. Join us. Santa Fe, New Mexico. St. Francis Cathedral, Father Gerard speaking. On a summer evening, a call came in to the rectory of the St. Francis Cathedral. The caller needed someone to administer last rites. I cannot drive at night, but Father Patrick Gerard was unable to leave. He asked the caller to telephone again in 15 minutes when another priest would be on duty. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Exactly 15 minutes later, the telephone rang again. This time, Father Ronaldo Rivera took the call. This is Father Ronaldo. Hello, Father. I need the help of a priest. My grandfather is dying. Oh, the caller insisted that a priest come immediately. Are you familiar with the rest stop just south of Santa Fe? Yes, yes, I am. I'll see you there. The man said that his name was Michael Carmelo and that he was calling from a rest stop near Waldo, New Mexico, 20 miles away. Goodbye, Father. Father Rivera left that evening to meet someone at the rest area in Santa Fe. This was on a Thursday evening. He was reported missing Thursday night, then show up Friday. There was a broadcast made that Father Rivera was missing. Obviously, we had a location, at least we knew it was Waldo, somewhere in that area, because the priest remembered Waldo, New Mexico. Three days after he vanished, Father Rivera's body was found on a deserted road three miles from the rest stop. From Saturday until his burial, the city was just awe-stricken. Whether you were Lutheran, Catholic, Protestant, Jew, we were just all one at that time. The very fact that he went out there on this call was an act of charity, an act of love. I think because he showed this love for people, the people just responded. And so when he died, I think there was that uh, sadness in their heart for somebody that they loved. Everybody loved Father Renal. I'm sure he's happy where he is now. And we miss him. Catholic priests vowed to become servants of God and servants of their community. Their door is always open. But, as was the case in New Mexico, that very openness can also be exploited, especially by someone with diabolical intentions. The night of the murder, the man who summoned Father Rivera was waiting for him at the rest stop in a blue pickup truck. The killers were probably there waiting for him. When he arrived at the rest area, they singled him out. Father. Yes. Are you the priest they sent? Yes, I am. I'm Father Ronaldo. Why don't you come with There's us? There's no way one individual could have handled Father Rivera. He would have given them a hard time. So there had to be at least two people involved. And we know they had a gun, obviously, because he was shot. So I'm sure they controlled him with that weapon. but. There had to be two people involved to subdue him because he was a very strong individual. Lieutenant Ulibri believes that the killers took Father Rivera to a remote desert area. 
go. Let's go outside. Move! Come on, move! Come on, move it. Move, move! Right there. He was not killed where he was found. They drove to a location, threw him on the ground, and they left. They could have hit him anywhere in that Waldo area, and there's several places in Waldo where you can hide a, hide a body and you never find it. So obviously they wanted him to be found. After the crime, the killers returned to the rest stop to remove Father Rivera's car. His vehicle was found in a rest area just east of Grants, New Mexico, which is about two hours from Santa Fe. There was no physical evidence found in the vehicle. We didn't find any fingerprints. There was no blood stains, nothing to indicate that someone had even driven the car. It had been wiped clean. The Santa Fe police had few clues, and after a nationwide check, they found no suspects named Michael Carmelo. As far as motive, Father Rivera was not the target. A Catholic priest was a target for whatever reason. Robbery was not a motive because there's nothing taken from the priest other than his last rites kit. And that's a possibility for a souvenir. Apparently the killer would like to relive the experience. Every time he looks at it, he remembers killing a priest. Two years later, another priest mysteriously vanished, this time in Ronan, Montana. At 11 p.m. on the night that he disappeared, Father John Kerrigan went to a bakery across the street from the church to chat with his parishioners. After a few minutes, he said that he was returning home to go to bed, but he was never seen again. The next day, at a highway turnout, a passerby discovered a pile of bloody clothes. Blood all over the shirt. After we realized that they were Father Kerrigan's, we did a search of that area. A bloody coat hanger was found close to the clothing. We concluded that the coat hanger could have been used to either tie someone up, could have been used to strangle someone, but it definitely is connected to the clothing. And it wasn't just a hanger laying there. It had been deformed and definitely used for some purpose. A week later, Father Kerrigan's car was found five miles from the area where his clothes had been discovered. We know that car sat there for approximately a week before it came to our attention. So we did a thorough search of that area and we found the keys lying in tall grass. There was blood on the front seat in the right door panel on the right floorboard. We found a shovel in the trunk with blood on it. We found a pillow in the trunk with blood on it. Police also found Father Kerrigan's wallet, which contained more than $1,000 in cash. The money was not hidden. It was just normally as it would have been kept in a wallet. And none of that was disturbed. So we don't feel that robbery was a motive for this particular crime. When Lieutenant Ulibri learned of Father Kerrigan's disappearance, he flew to Ronan to investigate the similarities between the two cases. In both cases, the killer wanted people to know I killed a priest. And here's the evidence to show I killed him. I still strongly believe that uh, whoever killed Father Rivera was involved with Father Kerrigan. There are other similarities. Both victims' cars were driven away from the crime scene, and both were wiped clean of all fingerprints and evidence. A metal coat hanger was found near Father Kerrigan's clothes, and there's evidence of a coat hanger used in Father Rivera's murder. In both cases, robbery was not a motive, and both priests belonged to the Order of Franciscans. If there's other law enforcement agencies that have had a Catholic priest killed, with some of the similarities we have just discussed here, we'd like to hear from them. There's a possibility we have a serial killer going killing Catholic priests. Next, a man's search for his brother, who was kidnapped as a baby, 
and never seen again. Chicago, Illinois, 1953. Jeffrey Harding's mother showed him some scrapbooks stored in the attic. She explained that he has a brother who was kidnapped before Jeffrey was born. I just didn't know what to do. I felt so empty inside, and I felt so, so sad for my parents. I could just look in my mother's eyes and see the pain. These two girls came, and they took them, and they ran. Will I ever see him again? No. And I, I also wanted to know what it was like to have a brother. And I always felt cheated that I couldn't communicate with him. I couldn't play with him. I couldn't wrestle with him. couldn't go to a ball game with him. I couldn't do anything like everybody else did with their own brother and sister. This is the article. FBI reported in search for kidnapped baby. Jeffrey's mother brought out a baby book and read in clippings that she had saved about the events of June 30th, 1944. That morning, she put 10-week-old Lawrence Jr. in his carriage and made her usual trip to the corner market. And while she was in the store, there were two girls there, that, teenage girls that didn't look like they were up to anything bad. Oh, what a doll! <laughs> you really have a cute baby. Oh, thank you. It's my first. As my mother was coming home from the market, the two girls were following her. But she didn't think a whole lot of it. She just thought that the two girls were walking down the street as she was going home. And when she pulled into the yard with the baby carriage, she saw a neighbor uh, who lived upstairs. Can you mind little Lawrence for me? Sure, I will. I'm just going to run these inside. Okay. The lady who was supposed to be watching my brother didn't um, keep an eye on him long enough. She watched him for a little while, and then she kind of turned away. Hey, you two, stop! Margaret! Hey! Ah! Back! My baby! Stop! Wait! By the time my mother, who was running as fast as she could, got to the alley and could, could run after the girls, could give chase to the girls, the girls were gone. After three agonizing days, the Hardings received a phone this? call. We have your baby. You have the baby? The girl on the other end of the line identified herself as one of the people that took the baby. And the girl said, we're going to bring the baby to you. And my mother said, when? Will you please bring him home? And as she was waiting for an answer, the girl hung up on her. She was never asked for a ransom, and that was the last contact my mother had with the kidnappers. The FBI and the Chicago police searched for Lawrence Jr., but after four weeks, the investigation was called off. The 10-week-old infant was gone. When my mother told me what had happened, and I think it was then that a seed was kind of planted inside of me that because I love my parents, I wanted to make this right for them. Thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, Jeffrey was able to get the original FBI file on his brother's case. He and private investigator Paul Rigsby learned that the FBI interviewed two railroad porters who had an interesting story to tell. July 4th, 1944, Chicago's main train station, four days after the kidnapping. The FBI file from Washington that we were able to get a copy of indicated one of the teenage girls showed up at the train station with a baby meeting the description of Lawrence. Excuse me, ma'am. Are you going to St. Louis? Yes, I am. Well, would you mind holding my baby for a moment? I don't know. Well, I just have to run to the washroom, and there's really nowhere for me to put him down in there. Well, I've got to get that train. So you, you hurry up now. I don't want to be a standee. OK, I'll be back in just a moment.
more than likely the woman was on the platform with the baby, the train's fixing to pull off, and she's not sure if the teenage girl is on the train or not on the train. And realized that it was her time to get on the train and, and was believing the teenage girl when she had told her not to worry. And more than likely she got on the train with the child waiting for the teenage girl to find her. However, after the train took off, it became obvious that the teenage girl didn't make the train. Track three, arriving from Chicago. When the older woman with the baby arrived at Union Station in St. Louis, she approached two porters, uh, George Hill and a Charlie McCall, and explained to them how she came by the baby. Can you help me? Yes, ma'am. Have you seen anybody around here looking for a child? No, ma'am. What was she wearing? She also told him that she was going to Magnolia, Arkansas, but told him that if that mother decided she wanted the child, she'd be in Magnolia and she could find her there. I got nine children of my own. I know one more won't hurt me. Well, I'll keep an eye out for her, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi, my name is Paul Rigsby. I'm an investigator. Paul traveled to Magnolia to conduct interviews and search the town's records, but turned up no trace of the woman or her family. Then Paul theorized, and, and I do believe this is true, that more than likely because it was July 4th weekend that this lady returned from Magnolia, Arkansas, either to Chicago or maybe even to Detroit, and that may be where my brother is today. The woman at the train station probably thought that the girl didn't want this child. I believe that this woman was a good Samaritan. Uh, she took care of the child. She did everything she could uh, to let the porters know where she was going. And uh, in, in no way, shape, or form did she have anything to do with the abduction. Jeffrey has vowed not to give up until he finds his brother, who is probably unaware of his unusual past. If there's anything that I dream about as being the happy ending, it would be finding my brother, finding out that he was raised in a loving environment, finding out that um, he would be willing to accept me and accept my family, and that we could spend our lives together as friends. Today, Jeffrey's brother would be in his 60s. However, he would not know his real birth name or birth date. Jeffrey hopes that his brother or one of his nine adoptive siblings is watching right now. Coming up, a policeman is gunned down in a bank robbery, and one of the suspects is a straight A college student. Right in Massachusetts, September 23rd, 1970. Three criminals hold up the State Street Bank at gunpoint. Two other gang members wait outside in cars. As police arrive at the scene, a patrolman is shot. He dies the next day. The search for the thieves is now a murder investigation. What makes this crime unusual is that two of the felons were students at the prestigious Brandeis University, Catherine Power and Susan Sachs. Their involvement was a sign of the troubled times. The drawn out conflict in Vietnam had triggered outrage across the country. Demonstrations and protest marches became commonplace, especially on college campuses. A straight-A student who was once named Outstanding Teenager of Colorado, Catherine Power earned a full scholarship to Brandeis University in Waltham, Massachusetts. There, she became heavily involved with the most violent anti-war movements. There was a loose but effective network of underground groups that were responsible for numerous robberies, numerous uh, thefts of weapons, and funneling this money and materiel through an underground system to some of the more radical, more violent groups that existed in those days. Catherine Power soon joined with others who shared her radical views. 
Susan Sachs was an honor student from Philadelphia. Stanley Bond was a convicted felon studying at Brandeis as a part of a parole program. Catherine Powers, Susan Sachs, and Stanley Bond believe that violence was a proper means to an end. In three months, the group robbed over a dozen banks to fund their revolution. Bond recruited two fellow inmates out on parole, Robert Valeri and William Gilday. Their crime spree continued. On September 20th, 1970, the group stole automatic weapons and explosives from a Massachusetts armory and then firebombed the building. Three days later, the gang prepared to rob the State Street Bank in Brighton. The day started normally for Boston Police Patrolman Walter Schroeder and his partner, Frank Callahan. Just two years earlier, Schroeder had received a special commendation for preventing another robbery at the State Street Bank. I never had to worry about my back when Walter with me. Nothing seemed to scare him. Nothing, nothing fazed him at all, especially if someone was in trouble. He'd uh, go all out to see if he could help them, regardless of what the situation was. I've never, I never saw him back down from any, any incident. Schroeder and Callahan were on patrol as the gang left their hideout. Bond, Valeri, and Sachs planned to go into the bank. Gilday was assigned to watch the entrance from across the street. Power was to wait a few blocks away in the switch car. Bond, Valeri, and Sachs pulled up to the bank. Sachs entered through a side door. The others went in through the front door. Everybody, this is a hold up! Money in the bank! One teller pressed the silent alarm, and police were called to the scene. Cop 14-4, we have a side alarm at the State Street Bank. Please respond. Cop 14-4, please respond. 14-3, we'll back up that unit at the State Street Bank. Come on! Come on, ladies, move it! I need that back! As the robbers ran out of the bank, the plan started to unravel. Gilday began shooting. When we arrived at the bank, I heard six or eight shots, but I uh, didn't know where they were coming from. Evidently, Walter didn't realize where they were coming from because he ran right toward this man. And uh, he finally realized where they were coming from, and he tried to turn around and run, get around the corner of the bank, but he didn't quite make it. I realized Walter was hurt when I saw him fall. I was hoping that he had just tripped, but deep down, I knew that he was hit. The robbery had netted $26,000 in cash. Bond distributed $500 in spending money to each member of the gang and held on to the rest. Let's get out of here. Within eight hours, the five robbers had all gone their separate ways. Officer Schroeder was in the hospital fighting for his life. His partner kept a silent vigil throughout the night. He was shot in the back through the aorta, the main artery to the heart. I guess Walter died around 10 o'clock in the morning, and uh, it really uh, hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, I, uh, he was a real, uh, I was real close with Walter. He was a real friend. The effect of his death was devastating. Um, as time has passed, we've learned to adjust to it. But I think that it's created a void that has never been filled and, and really can't be filled. Within 24 hours, the Boston Police Department picked up Robert Valeri. Five days later, Stanley Bond was arrested in Grand Junction, Colorado. The day after that, Gilday was apprehended in Worcester, Massachusetts, after a high-speed chase. Gilday was given two life sentences for the murder of Officer Schroeder. Valeri spent five years in jail and was released. 
Stanley Bond accidentally killed himself with a makeshift bomb that he had built for an escape attempt. Susan Sachs was arrested five years after the murder. She spent seven years in prison and was released in 1982. But one gang member eluded capture, Catherine Power. A surveillance camera caught a glimpse of her several years after the murder as she opened up a bank account in Louisville, Kentucky. It was the last reported sighting of power. We have to be realistic. The times have changed. And I think if Kathy were to turn herself in or to be apprehended, she could be tried, she would be found guilty. But I think a lot of things would have to be taken into consideration at the time of her sentencing. You know, we all function as a single unit, as a society, and that there are lines of behavior that are acceptable, and there are lines, you know, once you step over that line, it's not acceptable. Her behavior, as with the other people involved, is unacceptable. And you have to be called to task on that. You have to take responsibility for what you do, whether it's something that happened yesterday, last year, or 20 years ago. Update. After 23 years on the run, Catherine Power turned herself in. She had been living in Lebanon, Oregon, with her husband and 14-year-old son under the assumed name of Alice Metzinger. After pleading guilty to armed robbery and manslaughter, she received a sentence of 8 to 12 years. Power was released from prison in October 1999 and rejoined her family in Oregon. Next, meet a master of the ancient art of Qi Gong, who some believe can heal the sick. Canton Province, Southern China. In the 1970s, a young doctor from Shanghai named Hong Lu climbed to a cave hidden high in the mountains. Lou had grown up in a family of doctors schooled in traditional Western medicine. But he suspected there was more to healing than just science. The cave was home to a revered healer named Quan, a man who reportedly could diagnose illness with a single glance. He could perform cures without even touching the patient. For eight years, Hong Lu studied the ancient art of Qigong, designed to tap the energy of the universe to find enlightenment and heal the sick. Today, Dr. Hong Lu is one of only 12 Qigong high masters in the world. He lives in Southern California and is the only one of those masters practicing in the United States. Qigong, Qigong is not a miracle cure. Qigong Qigong can improve health. Qigong can cure some illnesses, but it cannot cure every illness. Salem Babak was in the final stages of AIDS. When he made his first visit to Master Lu, accompanied by his mother, Salem was already partially paralyzed. I really wanted and hoped that there was somebody out there that had a magic wand that was going to wave it over me and say, oh, you're cured, you have your full use of your left side back. That's, that's the kind of, you know, that's where I was coming from at the time. Salem was also losing his vision and had recently been diagnosed with PML, a brain virus certain to end his life. I remember asking my physician maybe a month or so after I was diagnosed, do you have any other PML patients? He says, yes. And I said, how are they? They said, they're all dead. Master Lu claims that he can simply look at his patients and see where their qi energy flow is blocked. And then he uses his own qi to help clear the path. The session had just begun when Master Lu's apprentice removed Salem's leg brace. And then Master Lu told Salem to rise. Okay, don't worry. Okay. Oh, eyes. I was amazed. I couldn't believe that I was standing without the aid of anything. 
It felt like something was coming into my body from afar, from behind me when Master Lu was working on me. It felt like something, something was penetrating my skin and as a result making me stand upright. Every time I felt myself leaning this way or leaning that way or falling, he would just push his energy into my body and that would make me stand upright again. From that day on, weekly sessions with Master Lu were a regular part of Salem's therapy. The good part is that he is also using Western medicine. So that's why I think if I use Qigong with Western medicine and they work together, what will happen? The effect has been positive. In addition to Qigong, Salem began a new regimen of AIDS drugs. To Salem, the result of the combined therapies was nothing short of a miracle. Within six months, he had regained 80% of the mobility on his left side and could walk without a crutch or a brace. I was quite surprised to see Salem recover in the way that he did. In my experience, patients with AIDS and PML uh, do not uh, improve, they deteriorate. I cannot say Master Lu cured me, but he definitely brought me to the road of recovery. If you can imagine coming from the point of being diagnosed as somebody who's just as good as dead to where I am now, I mean, it's just, I'm elated. I'm totally elated. How it works, I don't know. I don't know. But I honestly feel it worked for me and it can work for others. Randy Hebert says that he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Three doctors told him that he should have surgery. Instead, he tried Qigong. Master Lu put Randy on a macrobiotic diet, taught him exercises to do at home, and gave him treatments three times a week. I know that other people that he has worked on, uh, they, they've gotten into trance-like states. Uh, I never did, but I did feel something going through me, something, almost like heat. After seeing Master Lu for three months, Randy had a biopsy. Yes, your biopsy results are negative. There's no sign of cancer. <sighs> That's great. Randy's cancer eventually returned and he had to have surgery, but he still believes that there are benefits from the practice of Qigong, even if the medical community remains skeptical. Despite 4,000 years of history, I think that Qigong and other uh, forms of alternative therapies really need to be held up to the same uh, light and uh, burden of proof, burden of evidence, that traditional medicine is held up to. Modern medicine solves many problems but it has some areas that need improvement. Qigong, generally speaking, is a good supplement. That's why I recommend Western medicine combined with our method. This is more guaranteed for the patient. Officially, the American Medical Association has no opinion on the practice of Qigong or if it's a legitimate healing technique. But to those who have experienced its benefits, Qigong remains a useful tool in the fight against illness. Coming up, a generous gift helps a man launch his dream restaurant. Decades later, he's searching for his long lost benefactor. On a previous broadcast, we brought you the case of 22-year-old Matthew Chase of Los Angeles. Matthew disappeared after making a withdrawal from an ATM machine. The bank camera took these photographs of a mysterious man standing next to him. The person standing next to Matt was somewhat shorter, somewhat stockier, and overall he shouldn't have been in the photograph. No one is going to let someone stand that close to him while they're using an ATM machine where they can see the PIN number. Police believe that Matthew was abducted in a robbery attempt and that the mysterious man was his kidnapper. Today, I sense that he's still alive, and that has 
kept us going, and we'll never stop looking for him until we find him, and I know we'll find him. Matthew's friends and family canvassed Los Angeles searching for him, but turned up nothing. Los Angeles can be a dangerous place at night. We saw a lot of things that were very frightening, I think, and that only made it more real to us that, that something perhaps very serious had happened to Matt. Update. Nine months after he vanished, remains were found in a ravine in nearby Pasadena. They were positively identified as Matthew Chase. The cause of death was a gunshot wound. This case is being handled as a robbery homicide at this point. The man in the bank photograph is wanted for questioning in the disappearance and death of Matthew Chase. This is an artist's rendering of the prime suspect in this case, based on computer enhancements of the bank photographs. Matthew's car was also stolen and later abandoned. It was a red two-door 1983 Volkswagen GTI. This blue bandana was found inside. It may have belonged to the killer. I do hope to find his killer. And I think that we need to see this through, and we will see it through, and this person must be brought to justice. Thank you. Those two little words can carry a lot of weight. In our next story, you'll meet a man who is determined to thank a friend and benefactor, even if it took 20 years. Phoenix, Arizona. Moses Trevis is a critically acclaimed chef who opened two award-winning Mexican restaurants in Arizona, both named Such Is Life. How Moses chose that name is at the center of his own personal unsolved mystery. Decades earlier, Moses had been the day cook at a small taco stand on the island of Cozumel in Mexico. He was known for making the best tacos in town. One of Moses' favorite customers was an American tourist named Judy. Hi, Moses. Oh, hi, Judy. You want usual? <laughs> yes, por favor. She was a school teacher who had visited Cozumel several times. Moses vividly remembers Judy and her last visit to the island. Oh, she was very nice. Lady, quiet lady, with a book all the time. And she asked me if I can, uh, uh, if I have time to, because she wants to go to the mainland, which is across the, the island, which is, you know, 15 miles, 17 miles across the island. And the mainland is where all the ruins are. Oh, yes. And then you know, The next day, Moses closed up shop. He set off with Judy on a day-long trip to the Mayan pyramids along the Yucatan Peninsula. Around noon, they stopped for lunch. Moses, wouldn't you like to own a restaurant like this someday with tables and chairs? Oh, yeah, you know, I dream to open a restaurant, but, you know, no money. Uh, yeah. Such is life. Excuse me? Such is life. Uh, it means that's the way life is, you know. Such is life. I like that, <laughs> yeah. You know what, Judy? When I open my restaurant, I want to call Such is Life and put it on the menus and... That's Nothing yeah. more was said. But for Moses, an idea had taken root. Yeah, no problem. By day's end, goodbye. it was time to say goodbye. Oh, I have something for you. Yeah. Oh, no tip. No, 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 no. It's not a tip. No. Before parting, Judy had something that she wanted to give Moses. Don't open. Okay. Okay. Goodbye. Bye, Thank Judy. When Moses opened the envelope, he was stunned to find $500 and a handwritten note. Dear Moses, go make such as life happen. Love, Judy. Moses did just that. Within a month, he had opened his own tiny restaurant on Cozumel. Naturally, he named it Such Is Life. He was excited about Judy's next visit but he never saw her again. Flash forward 20 years. Moses Trevis is a US citizen with two very successful restaurants in the Phoenix area. 
all thanks to the generosity of his friend Judy. But he hasn't seen her since that day in Cozumel, and he wants to thank her in person. Hi, Judy. Update. When this story aired, Judy happened to be watching Unsolved Mysteries. Three days later, she called our phone center, and she and Moses made plans to meet. Judy traveled to Tucson and got to see how far Moses had come from his Cozumel taco stand. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's so uh, good to see you. <laughs> mm, it was just wonderful. I never thought it's going to happen. It happens. Like it? Yes, it's great. It's beautiful. Very impressed. <laughs> Let me Such see your eyes. Life. Let me see your eyes. <laughs> when he started his restaurant, Moses had the story of Judy's generosity printed on all of his menus. I didn't know how much, you know, it meant to him, and so I, I was very touched. It made me cry when I saw it, really. I was very touched by it. I can't believe it. I don't either, but it happens, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> it's amazing. Never would have thought that he would have remembered me all this time or that it had that much of an impact on him. So I'm very flattered and I'm very happy and I appreciate that he appreciated.